Here's an example of a linear programming problem. Suppose that Julie works as a dog walker and a babysitter for another family. She earns $8 an hour walking the dog and $9.75 an hour babysitting. She would like to earn as much as possible. This is the quantity that will maximize. However, she can work no more than 20 hours per week, the dog must be walked at least 5 hours per week, and the longest that the family needs Julie to babysit each week is 7 hours. These are the constraints. Clearly, if there were no constraints, she could maximize her revenue by babysitting every hour of every day, but the limitations are what make this problem interesting, and also what make it realistic. Before we start solving this problem, let's look through the problem statement and identify a few things. First of all, we want to identify what we call our objective function. The objective function is the quantity that we're trying to maximize or minimize, the quantity we're trying to optimize. Reading through this, we're explicitly told that what we want to maximize is earnings, how much Julie earns. Usually though, it's not stated quite so explicitly, so we need to read through the problem carefully to find what we're trying to maximize or minimize. Secondly, we need to look for the constraints. So these are the two main parts of a linear programming problem statement, the objective function and its description, and then the constraints. So looking through, the objective function is stated as her earnings, and we're told some information about how she earns money. $8 an hour walking the dog, and $9.75 an hour babysitting. The other side of the problem, again, is the constraints. And the constraints we're given is that she can work no more than 20 hours per week. So she has a total work constraint, the total amount of work she can do. We're also told that the dog must be walked at least five hours per week. So there's a dog walking constraint. And the longest that the family needs Julie to babysit each week is seven hours. So there's a constraint on babysitting as well. So there's a constraint on each piece individually, and there's a constraint on the total amount that she can work. These three constraints will come into play, and each of them will be an inequality that constrains what we can do. In other words, these put limitations on how many hours she can spend doing each job. Now we can actually start solving the problem. The first thing we do in every linear programming problem is to define the variables. We'll only overwork with problems that have two variables, so we'll call them x and y. These principles that we'll learn can be applied to problems with many more variables, but in that case the graph is harder to draw or in some cases impossible to draw, so we'll stick to two variables so that we can draw the picture. The variables are always the quantities that we can control or the quantities that we need to decide on. In this case, we need to decide how many hours Julie spends doing each job. That's what we can set at the end of the problem. That's what we're told to decide on. So I'll define x as the number of hours that Julie spends dog walking, and I'll define y as the number of hours that she spends babysitting. Once we have the variables, we can move on to step two, which is to define explicitly the objective function. And here when I say to define the objective function, what I mean is to write it in terms of x and y. So we need to go back to the problem statement and see again what determines her earnings, which is the objective function. We're told that she earns $8 for every hour that she walks the dog, and $9.75 for every hour that she spends babysitting. Therefore, her total earnings from dog walking will be eight times however many hours she spends doing that. And her total earnings from babysitting will be 975 times however many hours she spends doing that. Therefore, her earnings, which I'll call P for profit, will equal eight times however many hours she spends dog walking plus 975 times however many hours she spends babysitting. If you ever struggle when writing down the objective function, think about a concrete example. Think about if she spent one hour dog walking and two hours babysitting. If you go back to the problem statement, if she spends one hour dog walking, two hours babysitting, you could easily figure out how much she makes total. You would naturally multiply $8 times one plus 975 times two and add them together. So if you can think about a concrete example like that and then pay attention to what you did to find the, the amount of her earnings, that will tell you how to write the objective function. 
So in this case, you would have multiplied 8 times the 1 hour dog walking, 975 times the 2 hours babysitting, and added them together. So in general, you'll multiply 8 times x, 9.75 times y, and add them together. So that's our objective function. Once we've got the objective function, we'll set it aside until nearly the end of the problem. Most of the problem is spent working with the constraints. We'll define the constraints, and then we'll draw a picture to represent them. And then eventually, we'll come back to this objective function. So now, step three is to find and describe the constraints. Again, we need to go back to the word problem, and we have these three constraints that we pointed out. The amount of total work that she can do is constrained, the amount of dog walking she can do is constrained, and the amount of babysitting she can do is constrained. Let's take them one at a time. The total work constraint says that the combination of hours spent dog walking and hours spent babysitting cannot exceed 20. In other words, they have to be less than or equal to 20. So, the number of hours spent dog walking is x, number of hours spent babysitting is y, the sum of those has to be less than or equal to 20. We write that as x plus y less than or equal to 20. That's one constraint. That constraint represents the fact that she can work no more than 20 hours a week. No more means less than or equal to. The next constraint says that the dog must be walked at least five hours per week. In other words, x has to be at least five. The number of hours spent walking the dog must be at least 5. So x has to be at least 5, meaning x has to be greater than or equal to 5. And that's the second constraint. The third constraint says that the longest she can babysit is 7 hours a week. In other words, y at most can be 7, so y has to be less than or equal to 7. At the same time, though, we'll add a constraint that isn't mentioned, which is that y has to be greater than or equal to zero. This is never stated, but usually it holds true. In other words, it's impossible to babysit a negative number of hours in a given week. So in general, x and y both have to be greater than or equal to zero. Because I've got this constraint that x has to be greater than or equal to five, I've already got the fact that x has to be greater than zero, if it's also greater than five. So I don't need to write that down as well. But for the y, I'll write that down, that y has to be greater than or equal to 0, and we're told that it has to be less than or equal to 7. These are our three constraints then. And now we'll draw a picture. And the picture that we'll draw is the solution set of this system of inequalities. So we'll draw each of these lines solid, and then the shaded region that's bounded by all these inequalities. The solution set of the inequalities that are defined by the constraints is called the feasible region. And the reason it's called the feasible region is because it defines all the points x, y, or all the combinations of x and y that satisfy all the constraints that are feasible to use for the problem. So I need some axes, and I'm only going to draw the upper right hand quadrant of the coordinate plane. The reason, again, is that x and y are both positive all the time, so I don't need to draw any part where they're negative. Then to draw the first constraint, x plus y is less than or equal to 20, well first I need to put some labels on the axes. Before I put labels on the axes, I'm going to find the intercepts of this. And the reason is that that will tell me how far I need to go along x or y in order to ensure that I have the full picture. So if x is 0, in this case y is 20, and if y is 0, x is also 20, which means I need to include at least up to 20 on both axes. So I'll put 20 up here and up here, and that defines my scale. So then halfway along would be 10, and then these would be 5 and 15. And these pictures don't have to be perfect. They just have to be good enough to give us an idea of what's happening. Now, drawing the line that connects 0, 20 to 20, 0, and I draw this line solid, looks like that. The next inequality is that x is greater than or equal to 5. So the line x equals 5 is a vertical line at 5. And then x greater than or equal to 5 will be all the points to the right of that. So we're looking at all the points to the right of this vertical line. And it turns out for the first inequality, x plus y less than or equal to 20 
that we're looking at the lower side of that line. So underneath the first line and to the right of the second line. But we're not done yet, we still have one more inequality. The third constraint is that y is less than or equal to seven, but also greater than or equal to zero. The line y equals seven is this horizontal line at seven. And the fact that y is less than or equal to seven means below that. But the fact that y is greater than or equal to zero means above the axis. So the area below the first line to the right of the second line and below the third line means we're looking at this region right here. This is the region that we want shaded in. This is the feasible region. The next step is to find the corner points of the feasible region. The reason we do this is that we have a theorem that tells us that the optimal point, the point we're looking for, is going to be one of these corner points of the feasible region. So we've limited ourselves to four possibilities. These four corners of the feasible region. If the feasible region is more complicated, you can have more corner points, or if it's simpler, you can have fewer, but in this case, we happen to have four. So all we have to do is find the coordinates of these four points. Now, I mentioned that when we graph lines using the intercepts, we can save ourselves some work. And the reason that is, is that in this case, for instance, this corner point we already know is the point 20, zero, because we graph that first line using the intercepts. So we saved ourselves a little bit of work. This lower left corner point is also one that we can tell right away is the point five zero. And then this upper left corner point, well, we know that this vertical line is all the points where X is five. The horizontal line is all the points where Y is seven. So where they cross, X is five, Y is seven, it's the point five seven. So we got three of the points without having to do any real work. This fourth point we'll find by solving the system of equations. The system of equations is x plus y equals 20 and y equals 7. Now that's a fairly straightforward system to solve. We are in fact given half the answer and we can simply substitute that into the first equation to find x. If y is 7, x plus 7 equals 20, x therefore has to be 13. So you have the point 13, 7. And those are the coordinates of the four corner points. So we found them and labeled them. The sixth and final step is to evaluate the objective function at the corners of the feasible region. In other words, we have these four corners and we know that one of them is the optimal point. All that remains is to find which one of them it is. Now remember the objective function in this case is that the earnings are 8x plus 9.75y. So we found that at the beginning of the problem and then set it aside until now. The four corners that we have are 20, zero, five, zero, five, seven, and 13, seven. All we do now is plug in the X coordinate and the Y coordinate into the objective function for each corner. So if X is 20 and Y is zero, we find P is eight times 20 plus 9.75 times zero and that is 160. So in other words, if she spent 20 hours dog walking and didn't babysit at all, she would make $160 each week. If she spent five hours dog walking and no hours babysitting, the amount of money she would make would be eight times five plus 9.75 times zero, which is $40 a week. So clearly the first one is better than the second one but we still haven't found which one is the best, or we aren't sure which one is the best yet. If she spends five hours a week dog walking, seven hours a week babysitting, then we let X be five, Y be seven, and find that the amount that she earns that week is $108.25. Still, so far, the first one is the best option. But let's test the last one. If X is 13, in other words, she spends 13 hours dog walking, and Y is seven, or she spends seven hours babysitting, then we find that her earnings each week are 172.25. And now we've found the best possible earnings. The most she can earn each week, given the constraints that she has, is $172.25. And that happens precisely when she spends 13 hours dog walking and seven hours babysitting. So notice that combination satisfies all the constraints, but it's also the best 
possible option. So by following this process, we've eliminated all other options and we found the exact point that gives her the optimal result.